I was involved with Dr. Kastner and Phoebus on a lot of this stuff earlier on, and uh, we were kind of happened into, we were always interested in meat color, and it is the most important criteria that people use to select products. And uh, they assume that if the color is right, that it's safe. And so that's what I'm going to raise a question for you on, is that do you believe that when we finish today? Is it color alone? So if you have questions at any time, why ask them as we go, because it's probably easier to, to do it then. Randy, do I press it on the side or the center? The side, yeah. The side? middle is your point. OK. Well, questions for you all. You've got to make a decision now. Don't answer out loud, but which steak looks safe to eat? Well, that's a little bit of a loaded question until I give you this. <laughs> can very really, this can be 0157, this can be spoilage organisms, and color may lead you astray. All right, that's intact muscle, or as Dr. Phoebus was saying, blade tenderized product. Could be this, it could be that, okay? Is it likely to be either one? Probably not, but it is a possibility. Which patty looks safe to eat? You're gonna pick A or B? B, okay. Well, this again is a loaded question because these patties were both cooked to 55 degrees C. This is about 131 degrees Fahrenheit. So the answer of which patty is safe to eat is probably neither one. But which one looks safe to eat? That is the issue. Do you know what that's called? USDA has a name for it. They got it from one of our graduate students here, a couple of our graduate students, that uh, named this uh, particular thing. We'll come back to it, but what it really leads me to say here is that you need to know a little bit about meat color because it's all wrapped up in whether you see the pink or the brown. And fortunately, consumers don't like to hear this. A lot of our meat science colleagues around the world don't like to hear this. They'd rather study bacteria than something as color of meat. Well, I kind of like the color of meat. Okay, you all know some of these. Maybe you don't know those names, but let me show you the picture. This is supposed to be kind of a purple colored meat, typical of vacuum packaged product. It is, if you cut across the meat the very first time and no one exposes it air, that's what it should be. That's natural, it's organic. It's whatever you want to call it, because it's the real unbloomed color. Poke a hole in your finger, the blood comes out, it turns into oxyhemoglobin. In this case, the meat exposed to oxygen becomes oxymyoglobin. And where is that color? Only about one or two millimeters below, on the surface and below. Most of it's this, where there's no oxygen. All right, another red one over here, this card call, called carboxymyoglobin. That's a little scary to most people because it's formed by carbon monoxide reacting with myoglobin rather than oxygen. They look the same. You have a hard time telling them apart. This is legal to use this under good quality control and it occurs in packages in, in a lot of stores across the country because this meat, the environment that it is in, is equivalent to this package here. It's purple until it reacts with carboxy and it looks like this. So we have a vacuum packaged product that is excellent for color stability, for flavor stability, taste stability, long time storage stability, just because it's back to this natural purple color. Okay, those things are, it's, and all these here, if you get down to the science, do you remember what? Any of you remember chemistry? Fe plus two? Iron. Iron. Iron's Fe plus two refers to a valence of two. That's called ferrous iron, O-U-S, or it's the reduced stage. And these are all got iron, it's a plus two. All right, now, unfortunately, we have this guy over here. 
the one that appears brown, called met myoglobin. And look how it's different down here because it's now the ferric iron or the one that has been oxidized. Only difference in these pigments here is the gain or the loss of one negatively charged particle, an electron. Tell that consumers and they aren't interested in all that, but that's partly why that meat was brown versus pink. Here's kind of how, all right? Myoglobin molecule, in the center of it, it's got the heme iron. That's really good because meat is nutritious because of the heme iron. It's one of the best places you can get new, uh, heme iron or nutrition. <coughs> Deoxymyoglobin will speed this up, was purple, ah, almost K-State purple, huh? And it's a, a plus two, okay? Now, in the meat industry, they take these off of carcasses, plate the uh, blue cut into the meat, it blooms with oxygen. We say that it blooms, it oxygenates, and it turns bright red to oxymyoglobin, and now we have oxygen attached to the, the heme iron, all right? In most textbooks, they show this going back here. I think that is a huge mistake it actually does kind of go there. It, it, it's, it's more complicated than that. But from a practical sort of meat color, let me take you through what our, I think everybody in the meat industry needs to understand to understand how it gets back. We, we like to go from bright red to purple because, and, 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 and make it back into a vacuum package. We do that at all the time. We take a carcass apart, it goes down all the conveyor belts through all Randy's interventions and everything and ends up in a vacuum bag, suck all the air out of it, seal it, and they ship it around the country again as a vacuum packaged piece of meat, okay? So this has to go from here to here and back to here, but it's not easy. And this is what confuses even a lot of some of my colleagues. <coughs> to go from here, this has oxygen in it, 20 point so percent in the air. So this is oxygenated over here. We got to get rid of it back here because this is zero. So when you take, start taking oxygen away and muscle, will you do that automatically? I mean, what what's muscles are for to move around and we use up some energy to get us from place to place that requires oxygen metabolism. And so th the meat will do it all by itself. And this one right here occurs so easy. That's just what's really perplexing because the brown color forms almost automatically. In fact, you all have probably seen this. If you have a couple steaks or a couple patties, put one bright red patty right on another one, leave it there for 10, 15 minutes, pull it off, and what have you formed? Some metmyoglobin. If it didn't happen, you'd wonder, what did they do to the meat? You see what I mean? So, that comes over here, the iron oxidizes, and to get back here, we've got to change, you can say, the plus three to the plus two, and we've got to get rid of the rest of the oxygen. So we've got to take more oxygen away, and then we have to do the reduction. That's the one muscle struggles with. The chemistry easily oxidizes. This one over here, it may not, may not ever happen. And so it can end up hung up into the brown thing, and that's kind of the retailer's nightmare. All right? So it's these things around here, and so this is why in the early 90s in there, when Jack in the Box was having the issue, we had some, uh, Dr. Castor and I and Dr. Croft and several others were working with graduate students because low-fat ground beef was kind of in, 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 the, in the thing then. McDonald's had the McLean. And so we were wanting to know something about the cook color changes of ground beef that went from 5% fat to 30% fat. And we found sometimes when we cooked it, it didn't turn out to be the normal color that we expected. I had a young lady by the name of Peggy Haig, Dr. Kastner. We had a, a set of these patties and there were a pretty good chore. We were cooking them to different endpoint temperatures. And she cooked them and came down and uh, they, they didn't go from the, the typical color pattern that we expected. So Peggy, I said, well, did you calibrate the skillet? Did you know what the temperature was? Did you measure everything right? She said, I'll go do it again, came back. And 
And uh, she said, Hunter, if you wanted to see it again, you go cook them the third time. <laughs> so what happened is that they turned out just like they were supposed to. We just weren't smart enough to know what was going on. And so we started seeing some of that, and we were back and forth to Washington, D.C. a time or two when they were talking about the jack-in-the-box and, and how and, and, and what USDA was saying and it was in school uh, art program things. They were taking hamburger patties and say, color me brown and I'm safe to eat. Don't eat it if it's slightly pink on the inside. We knew, we knew then that that was exactly the wrong message and nobody would believe us. And uh, we weren't always really for sure until we did a couple more things. And that's what I want to try to complete the rest of this story is, is how that all came about. Well, I, I said earlier that we use a grass fed, all natural beef burger and we cook them from raw. And even though we cook them way beyond where they should be, we cannot get rid of the bright pink color in the center of the burger. And we're getting co concerns from parents that we're serving kids raw burgers. And we're really careful. You remind me, I owe you two cents for that because that's what we're going to end on here oh. a little bit. But you got to tell me what to do about it. Ah, OK. <laughs> I can tell you what to do. All right. But you have to promise in between now, you all raise your hand and say, I'll remember this little thing right here. Because it is, it is, it is key. Because uh, we've got, and I've got to buzz through these things, talking again, oxidation reduction. High school chemistry is loaded with that. Okay? And then over here we have oxygen consumption. And this was oxygenation. This is oxygen D. This is deoxygenation and reduction going on, okay? Combining those two together. All right, here's the same thing, you all. These are little pieces of meat that's put in a plexiglass cube. And so there's an airspace here, airspace across the top, and if we push it against the sidewall of the container a little bit, we can have anoxic conditions or where there's no oxygen around there. And can you see this kind of a bright red layer of what? What's it called? Toc? Oxymyoglobin, there you go, oxymyoglobin around the border. What's this purple stuff on the inside? Deoxy, Deoxy. all right. You give it a little bit of time, the oxygen will penetrate in down through the surface just as far as the meat will allow it to go. And the deeper you go, the lower the concentration becomes. And when it gets down to a low concentration, it turns brown all by itself. And now you can see that layer of brown below it. And then in the, as the meat gets older and older in display, well, then that brown works its way out to the edge, and then they've got to either give it away, throw it away, discard it, discount it. And there's nothing really wrong with this. It's naturally there. And all this, you all, I think I've got on here, is independent of Dr. Phoebus and his microbes. It's just pure muscle color chemistry. Now, Randy, would, we would both say that this can be an influencing factor, but it, it doesn't have to be, okay? All right, so here we go. Now we're going to try to relate some of that fundamental, really simple little triangle to why meat can be pink or brown at certain temperatures. How many thousands of years have we known this? That if you take meat, the pigments in there, myoglobin, and you heat it, it denatures and changes color. Long time, right? Okay. So that's really nothing new. And that, that's why people couldn't think about, well, how can Jack in the Box do anything but, and, and foul this up? And generally, the color goes from a red or pink, whatever you start with, or turkey light meat, or chicken breast meat, why it's going to go from a lighter color to kind of a, something to a cooked tan or brown color. Okay? That, how many years have we been based on that for years, right? It's endpoint dependent temperature wise. Okay? Rare, medium rare, rare, I mean medium and 
medium well and all that, okay? So there's temperature involved with it, but pH of the meat also is very important to it. The acid-base balance of the product, this is a major factor, and we'll come back to yours in particular with that. And it's also depending, this cooking color depends upon whether you have oxy, deoxy, met, or carboxy myoglobin in the product. That's how you put all this all together and it, it makes it a little bit complicated. Bottom line here is that this red to pink to brown only occurs for intact muscle. The ground product doesn't work, okay? Now, most of us know that, right? Most of us know that because that kind of came out and in, in the mid 90s in there somewhere while USDA finally almost overnight they pulled off all everything off of their shelves that says, color me brown, cook it until it's no longer pink. Because they finally figured out that for me, pink I will eat. If it's brown on the inside, I've got a 50-50 chance of being wrong. Okay, and here's why. Premature browning. That's what USDA calls it, Peggy Hegg and uh, named it in here, that it, it prematurely browned when cooking. Here's the, here's the definition. The development of a well-done internal cooked appearance at endpoint temperatures lower than those needed to kill the pathogens. That's what happened to Jack in the Box, possibly. These lower temperatures we showed you slide number two in there when we showed you those patties cooked 130 or you know 133 degrees Fahrenheit. That's too low to kill any of the the bugs, and uh, but it made the meat turn brown prematurely in in one of them. All right, here it is over here again. This patty here, I would look at and the way I think now, if I see this, I'm I'm gonna and I think it's not bloody raw and juice running out of it. I'll eat that one. Over here, I'm worried. I don't, do I want to give it to my grandkids? Do I even want to eat it? I'm getting to be enough senior citizen that I might be more predisposed to some of these things that Dr. Peters is talking about. All right, as low as 55 degrees C. All right, natural colors in ground beef. Go through Dr. Phoebus when he's got all of his, what did you call that, Pap? I'd call it a, that's a, it's a monkey suit for him, okay? Anyway, he's in, the, he's in his white deal. You grind the product, it's going to oxygenate, and it's going to be bright red, border to border. So we pack that together and put it in a pound or two pound cent package and put it out for retail. Then somebody buys it this way, in this color. How do they make patties out of it? Where do they grab the meat for, if this is a pound package, we're going to make four quarter pound patties. Boom, boom, like that, or you grab a little here, you grab it off the edge. It can be anywhere, right? Well, that's all right for this one. But if you take that package and it's not purchased in the store, it sits there for a while. In the middle, the myoglobin chem or the muscle chemistry is going to start to use up the oxygen and it's going to get to a, low, a lower pressure of oxygen and it's going to turn brown all by itself. Okay? And if we wait a little longer and it doesn't get sold, the product is going to get a purple side in there, the brown layer in between, I showed you those layers, and a bright red layer on the outside, and they hope somebody buys that package before the brown layer gets clear to the edge. So, for $500, we did a senior food science project. Karen Killinger, Dr. Kastner, did this. She surveyed a bunch of the, the stores in Manhattan. She went around and prescribed days, times of the day, we visited with all the store managers and when did they put in the fresh product that was just ground and how long it had been there. She did this for about uh, six or eight months and she made patties uh, in a certain way and we determined that there was about a 50% chance of premature browning in the retail ground beef in Manhattan, Kansas. We took that to Washington and overnight for 500 bucks, Karen Killinger made, had a major influence on the public health policy recommendation from USDA. That had to be one of the most exciting things, I guess, in, 
in part of my career. So let's, let's make patties there. Those right there, because it's oxymyoglobin, there's a 50% chance that it's going to premature brown. All right, you come to this one, we got a mixture of brown and red. So it's going to be, if it's brown to start with, it's going to be brown when it's on the end. We didn't ever think of that. And then we had one grad student drop a tray of patties coming out of the freezer after, the, or after they had been thawed, and she found that inside the patty they were brown all the way through there, just like they were supposed to be. But did we break, do you ever break open your patty and say, hmm, what's on the inside? <laughs> No. So they were brown. That's why Peggy cooked them twice and they all came out brown because they were brown in there to start with. Met myoglobin is brown. They're going to cook up brown. That one was easy to explain. Why this one turns brown is something else. That's what USDA didn't believe and a lot of other people didn't believe. Okay, so if you make this one over here, it's going to be brown. I don't care what temperature you cook it to. So. The point is, is that if you make this one over here, you got some in there. If you make this one over here, it's going to tell you the truth because it's going to be purple to start with and it's going to be just like a steak or a roast that you cook from the intact. This one's going to go from red to pink to brown. Now, that's kind of confusing. That's why USDA doesn't have all that written out to try to get consumers. Here's some pictures, you all. Normal pH of meat is 5.6. Okay, this is cooked at 65 C. This is about uh, medium rare. Okay, and I don't know, can you see it's kind of, kind of red and kind of brown? But it's got more pink in it than brown. People would say, oh, I shouldn't eat this one because it hasn't been cooked right. Okay, we come over to this one. This was oxymyoglobin, the one that was bright red, and the one that was brown ought to have been brown, right? These are almost always brown. And, uh, and this is the one that we teach people to buy because it's a bright red color. It looks nice and bloomed and it's what, what people assume to be safe. All right. So these have got their normal pH, but this is, depends upon the temperature. And, and here's the other thing. You can buy intact muscle. You can buy packages now where they have modified atmosphere, steaks in a modified atmosphere a high oxygen atmosphere in a store and they'll be bright red and you take it home and my wife hates those things because you, it will, that steak will even premature brown. And here we've got people that are doing that and they're thinking, oh, it is safe. It could have been cooked rare and it's liable to be, it's going to be tan on the inside. So it can also go back into different packaging systems. Here's the bottom line, you all. You've got to know the endpoint temperature. You've got to know what the pH is, because if the pH is different than 5, 6, it's a different ball game. And then you have to know what pigment was in, look at this, in the center of the patty. Not what's on the edge, not what you see, but what's in the center, where it is the lowest temperature, slowest cooking part. All right, that's premature browning. Here, I just got this. In fact, Norwegians. Norwegians used to package uh, almost all their meat in a carbon monoxide system, and they've done it. They did it for 20 years, and then uh, they started to become part of the European Union, and the Union said, no, you can't do that because CO is dastardly compound. And so they kind of made them change from something that worked for them. They had had the safest packaging supply and the best color forever. Here's vacuum packaged meat. This is three different endpoint temperatures. This one here is, should be brown or close to being brown because it's about a well done. And so this kind of goes red, pink to brown. And these are pretty much brown clear across the board. <coughs> and this was in a high oxygen modified atmosphere hamburger patty. Okay. <coughs> oh, it says the oxymyoglobin is, is, is not trustworthy. All right, so here we go. This right here, we've known for years. You've seen USC's had cooking guides that tells you very rare, medium rare, well done. And it goes from red to pink to brown in a reliable manner if it's a steak or if it's a roast, okay? Or if it's a hamburger patty that came out of a vacuum package that's purple. 
on the inside. Okay? But ground beef, you can't rely on it. It, it, it lies to you a little bit. Because the true doneness is a mixture of redox form and the denature at different temperatures and different pHs. Okay? Premature browning, you all, since the, I mean, we've kind of forgotten about this a little bit. And uh, because the jack-in-the-box thing, and we've heard it, oh, cook to 160 for one second. Oh, yeah, I do that all the time. I got a little thermometer. I measure every patty we've got going. And uh, I hope you do, too. Because if you're cooking ground beef, the most widely used retail commodity of beef in the country, there's a lot of it around, and people at tailgates and here and everywhere, it's, uh, it's, it's a roll of the dice. And uh, I, I'm not willing to take that risk. And so we need to, if there's not an easy way. I would ask Dr. Phoebus though about this and Dr. Kastner because I know, why doesn't USDA require all ground beef to be vacuum packaged in purple? It's one of the simplest damned interventions going. It's a food safety intervention. And Randy back there hadn't been talking about it. And they could call it triple fried beef. <laughs> Vacuum packaged ground beef would at least give you an idea of a reliable color. But uh, you know, if a consumer buys uh, two pounds of patties and they only cook half of, them, half of them, they open the other half up, well, then the others, they don't know what's going on with them. But that's one way. Another is a radiation. Electronic pasteurization, or whatever we want to call it. Okay, a little dab of that. I, 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 it, I, I'm too old, you all. I just can't <laughs> quite see why we can't use some simple thing and USA or some regulatory agency. They don't give us a choice. Just do it. I mean, all the active consumer activists want us to do this and that, and they say, oh, my wife ought to not have to worry about cooking to 160 for one second. Randy already made the point, we're all invested in the food safety delivery system, and yet consumers still don't. USDA tells them to cook for 160. How many, how many of them put a probe in a, in a hamburger patty? Not many. Not many, if you, your surveys show that there's very few people want to do that. Well, putting it in right, have a, having a, yeah, there's all kinds of questions. But my whole point is that we could, we could make, maybe it still wouldn't be best, but we could irradiate it and you could eat it raw. Okay? All right. Now, here's the other thing. We thank you for asking this question because she said they bought some grass-fed, natural, organic, something or other. It sounds like, boy, it ought to be, really be good. And uh, then it comes out and she can't get it to turn brown. That's what we call hard to cook color or persistent pinking. It's not a food safety issue. Premature browning, PMB, is a food safety issue. This one right here is not a food safety issue. It's a quality issue. And what happens, here's patties down here that cook to the point that they, they've got pink in them. And they ought to be ought to be brown. And here's, here's some pork even that was cooked to 75 degrees C. That's very well done. And, and it's a pink patty or a pink chop. So we have this question coming a lot. In fact, we've even had it from the KSU Union when they were making stuff. They made meatloaf over there and they couldn't get the meatloaf to turn brown on the inside. And it's partly because of this. The pink color remains after a safe endpoint temperature. And you can cook it and cook it and cook it until these pack hamburger patties are hockey pucks or so. And they're not very palatable unless you use Hunt's ketchup. <laughs> well, then that's bad too, right? Anyway, that's a costly problem and, and consumers will reject it. I, I was out at, at Wendy's here just a couple of nights ago and I asked this guy, because they weren't very busy, and I asked him, well, do they have the type of patties where they're cooking them from both sides or if they're cooking them on a flat grill yet. This one was flat grill because the other one downtown has them coming this way. 
And uh, so I just talked with him about it a, a little. And uh, I said, do you ever have some that you can't, because Wendy's don't freeze their patties. They're always fresh, or un, not frozen, and they cook that way. And uh, do they ever have this? Well, I've been to Wendy's in, up in, back in uh, Ohio several different times and working with this type of thing, because if the pH gets a little bit wacko, you can have this happen. So what could cause the, the pink color? Well, you don't want to underlook the most obvious one. Maybe they didn't cook it as much as they thought. Okay? But these patties that get in food service, that gets to sit in some trays, and uh, the, 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 the chemistry is even a little more complex than what I told you about. It can have different types of, uh, if you cook it on a grill where you've got nitrogen gases and, and some of the flu through cook things at fast foods, they, they do that. Uh, vitamin E and reducing agents, all these things are good, okay? And that's probably what's part of, uh, in the her case, because she's talking about grass-fed. It's going to be more heavily laden with vitamin E, and it makes a contribution to the pink color. Uh, myoglobin amount and the redox forms, just like what we talked about before, and especially this one. Grass-fed beef, Dr. Castor, as we've found in the past, almost always has a pH slightly higher to moderately higher than normal. And so if you have product that is, that is a 5.8 or 6.0 in pH versus 5.6, it's harder to denature the protein. Muscle starts out at a neutral pH of 7. And then Randy's packing plants in there, they go into rigor mortis and get stiff as the pH goes down from about 7 to 5.6, 5.7, 5.8, okay, in there somewhere. Anything about 6 or above is going to have a slight pink color, and if it gets higher than that, it may have a moderately pink, and you can cook it and cook it and cook it, and it's still not going to disappear. My advice is get it to, get you a thermometer, measure the thing, and when you get it to at least not over 160, stop. Enjoy it. It's going to be safe. Thanks for listening. And get one of these and use it.